Welcome Excellent. everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Jackie Martinez and I'm a senior global product manager at New World Medical. New World Medical is a leader in developing, manufacturing, and marketing cutting edge medical devices intended to alleviate the suffering of glaucoma patients globally. Today we're presenting our third episode of the Ahmed ClearPath Taco Tuesday webinar series, highlighting the Ahmed ClearPath data discussion presented by world leading glaucoma surgeons, Dr. Davinder Grover, Glaucoma Specialist at Glaucoma Associates of Texas, and Dr. Sarah Van Tassel, Director of Glaucoma Service and Glaucoma Fellowship at Well Cornell Medicine Ophthalmology in New York. Just a little housekeeping before we get started, the webinar will be recorded for educational and training purposes. Please kindly mute your devices, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. The surgeons will bring them up during the presentation, and we will also have time for questions at the end. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Dr. Van Tassel. Hi, thanks everyone. And this is, um, this is fun. I think Taco Tuesday is a exciting concept. So it's nice to be here with uh, Dr. Grover. And we wanna jump right into talking about data because we know that's specifically what this webinar was designed for. So we'll have the moderators bring up Dr. Grover's um, poster from AGS and we will tell you a little bit about the six month data. So Devinder, what, um, what conclusions can you draw about the data that you looked at? Yeah, well, Sarah, uh, so good to have you uh, with me and or be here with you. And uh, and this, you know, I think our tacos are coming in a, about a half an hour. Uh, <laughs> so we'll enjoy them later, but, uh, but it's uh, so good to see you here. And um, um, yeah, this was basically, this is the poster we presented at AGS and it says my name on it, but it's actually, uh, on behalf of all six investigator groups, uh, around the country. And it kind of just explores our initial experience after, you know, new world, uh, medical launched the Ahmed clear path, um, and we went back and looked. It's so important to kind of, you know, even the design and everything looked intuitive and seemed great. Uh, it, you don't know it until the rubber hits the road. And so it's so important. I applaud New World for immediately looking back at the data to, to show this and evaluate it. And what it did was we just looked back at, you know, at six months um, of safety and efficacy um, in um, around the country and patients that, um, that had both the 250 or the 350. And there were about 100 subjects, about 104 eyes, I believe. And, you know, when you look at the, uh, uh, you, this slide is nice because this was the, present, the poster I presented on behalf of all the investigators at the AGS this year, virtually. Um, but it shows what the 250 and 350 looked like. And uh, the vast majority of the patients were uh, received the 250 clear path, which I think reflects kind of our user uh, pattern anyway. Um, but you can see at six months, uh, you see a significant and sustained drop in IOP a significant and sustained drop in medication dependence. Um, and what was impressive to me uh, specifically is that um, with 104 eyes, we did not see a single case of, of double vision or a single case of persistent hypotony, um, which I think speaks to the fact that most of these were 250s, um, but also um, also speaks to the fact that, you know, these smaller type of implants where you're not involving the muscles uh, perhaps can protect against the rates of uh, double vision that we saw um, in the TBT, PTBT, and um, ABC and AVB studies, uh, so it was it was really encouraging, and and I think you know as we're going to do our due diligence and, and report on the the twelve month outcomes, but unlike you know unlike MIGS, uh, I think once you get to the six point point and you have pretty good outcomes at six months with safety and, and efficacy, typically with tubes, we don't see that change dramatically. So I'm I'm, I'm hopeful that the, that the results will continue on this path. Uh, what do you think, Sarah? Were, you, were these kind of what uh, I know you were also an investigator uh, in the study. Yeah. Um, and uh, were these group results similar to what you've experienced? Yeah, I think this has been very consistent with my experience. In fact, one of the things I've noticed clinically is how um, low and diffuse the bleb is, which in the beginning I thought was a little challenging because we're used to seeing that ridge to know whether the, the tube is open. Um, at the three or four week mark, but I've really come around to loving the low diffuse blub and think that's probably related to the low, low diplopia rates. Um, what are some of the things you've observed clinically and features that you really like about this implant? 
Yeah, I think you I think you nailed a key point, you know, especially for people that are used to the barbell uh, implant, you see that ridge and you see that ridge mm -hmm. disappear when the tube opens. And, and when you don't yep. see that, it kind of it, set, it sets you off because your comfort zone mm -hmm. it's your safety blanket that you're used to seeing. So you don't see that. But, I, you know, the 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 design, uh, this was you know, the clear path was actually designed with a lot of uh, surgeon feedback. Um, and, and it really was a, a response that New World had to uh, to surgeons. Um, Including ourselves, that we're uh, we're asking for more innovation in the tube space, and um, and we did want something with a lower profile. Mm -hmm. uh, but the key thing that I love, and I I, I tend to use two fifties, and um, and this has really allowed me to change my whole kind of surgical approach. Really, uh, I used to block my patients. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they would be, my, our anesthesiologist would block the patients mm -hmm. in the pre-op holding area. And then they'd, they'd come to the OR kind of sedated on propofol. And sometimes they'd wake up coughing and, you know, post COVID, I, I didn't want any of that to happen. Um, and so I've switched to doing all my cases topical. And when I'm doing the 250, I can just give a little sub uh block on the table. Um, and because I'm not isolating the muscles, the patients do really well and they actually are very comfortable. So, you know, COVID actually has caused me to change my practice pattern as far as how I block. And, and the, the clear path has really been a nice, uh, uh, a nice add uh, or addition to that because I'm not having to block my patients. I'm not having to mess with the muscles and they're very comfortable. So I love the size and how, uh, how small the 250 is and how I can put it in without altering the muscles. Yeah. And implicit in that, I know there was already a, a Tuesday webinar about this, but the foldability of the device makes the 250 much easier. I think you also make your incision in the fornix. Is that right? You're four or five millimeters back. No, are you I, at the limbus? I, I do. I make uh, I make a fornix base incision, but I incise at the okay. limbus and do okay. a, a more traditional kind of approach uh, where I do a you know a four o'clock hour pritomy and okay. um, um, and then just slide it back there. And because it is flexible, it's easy to yep. slide in. Uh, do you uh, do you fold and and cut more posterior? I um I do. I like to make my incision uh, between four and six millimeters back, depending on the anatomy. And then uh, for the two fifties, I'll sort of fold it and tuck it. So you can do it in a similar, uh, with a similar size incision to a uh, uh, traditional Ahmed, like an FP7. Obviously oh, nice. for the 350, you need a little bit more because of the, the muscle hooking. Um, okay. But I think the flexibility of the device even makes my 350 incision a little bit smaller because you can hook one muscle and then the device actually kind of collapses to let you get under that. Um, second muscle. So I, I'm, I'm delighted with the flexibility. Uh, yes. What what if anything would make you put in a three fifty, a, a two fifty or three fifty? A three fifty, yeah. Is there um, any clinical scenario that would push you in was, that direction? If I didn't have a two fifty on the shelf and my back was a little, okay. um, <laughs> okay. yeah, I um, I really I've um, I changed to two fifties um, even before ClearPath came out, um, just because I think there were more, there's more and more data out there. Um, showing that the, the outcomes are not significantly different. Mm -hmm. And um, and then if I do, I know that um, what I've changed about five or six years ago is that um, if a patient needs a, a better pressure control after a, any tube shunt, um, mm -hmm. when I know the tube shunt is working, uh, I will then just supplement with some low energy CPC diode. And uh, if they're phacic and they need, their, you know, I need to go back in, I'll usually end up doing a cataract surgery and then maybe an ECP. But if they're pseudophagic, I'll just, uh, I'll just do low energy CPC diode. And, um, you know, I used to be, I used to have to put in an infernasal tube, a second tube, probably a couple times a month. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and once I've switched to doing, you know, I usually tell my patients I'm touching up their, their tube, basically, I don't want to feel like a, a refractive surgeon. Um, uh, but once I switch switch to, uh, you know, supplementing the tube with a low energy diode, if I need better pressure control, I maybe put in a, a an invernasal tube once a year now. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, what about you? Are you still doing both 250 350s? Yeah, I, I do um, I, for no other reason. I mean, for some clinical reasons, but also I just think it's really important for my trainees to be exposed um, to hooking muscles and to be able to do both. But I think, um, you know, for, for eyes that have had a prior surgery and failed or um, are exquisitely drop intolerant, that'll sometimes push me over to a 350. I do find, um, you know, consistent with the data that um, some patients do need an aqueous suppressant even after a almond clear path in order to stay at their target pressure. And I think a 350 
maybe gets you a point or two more, but in some people that can be the difference between being on one drop afterwards and, and not. So when I'm really trying for a drop free home run, um, okay. sometimes that pushes me towards a, a 350. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's nice. I mean, that's, that's, what's nice to have both on the, on the, as a, as an option. Um, yeah. Because, uh, because there are those patients, you know, that you, you know, maybe not even down to either one or none, but, you know, mm -hmm. being on three or one, you know, depending on the, on the plate size. Um, so yeah, the three fifties yeah. I've had, I'd put in, um, some were included in this trial. I think they did, they did really, really well. Yeah. Are you uh, a ripcord user? You know, I do, but I, uh, you know, I always do things differently because I just, I have to be <laughs> contrarian. So uh, yeah, I do like the rip cord. Um, and um, uh, that's some, another thing I've changed in my practice probably in the last two or three years. Um, and, and again, COVID made me kind of appreciate that change. So um, I now what I do is I actually tie off the tube with the 70 proline and I use a 40 nylon rip cord that I tuck in the infrotemporal quadrant. Um, and that basically, then, I, then I'm a little bit more aggressive with my fenestrations. And uh, so that provides me immediate pressure control. Um, and sometimes those fenestrations, I've had them work in for six months or even nine months or even a year and a half in patients. Um, and then, uh, but then I'm not worried at the four to six week point of if the tube's gonna open, when it's gonna open and, and I'm able to get my patients back to work right away. Um, and then, you know, I'll restart drops, wait for the eye to calm down. And I think the outcomes are a little better when you can open the tube two or three months later when the eye is perfectly quiet. Um, and then in clinic, I'll just do a little conch cut down and remove the, the rip cord. Um, so I don't use the rip cord that's included with the, with the implant. Um, uh, I replace it um, and then I'll just remove it in clinic. And then uh, for my young patients that have to get back to work, I can really, um, uh, or have other obligations, I can really mm -hmm. kind of cater it to their lifestyle so they take a week off when they have their first surgery and then they can go back to everything normal and then we schedule the re removal and then they can also alter their work or their activity so they're not you know in this two week four to six week limbo where they yeah. uh, you know don't know if they can do things and i found that to be really helpful especially with the pandemic when we shut down uh you guys mm -hmm. shut down tremendously more than we had yeah. to um and then we didn't see patients and, and we couldn't see them. And some patients just dropped off. And my patients that had the rip cord still tied off, they didn't have that issue of the hypotony uh, and the tube opening and all this other stuff. So yeah, so and uh, sorry, so your ligature is what suture material again? I, I tie it off um, with uh, seven proline. And then my rip cord is the four on nylon. So that okay. thing will actually stay closed forever. Yeah. Uh, until I actually open it. Um, and um, so, uh, so I think I, I have, you know, complete complete control and predictability about when and how it opens. And then I, you know, in the clinic, I'll stop all the drops, give a drop of atropine, rip, pull out the ripcord, and then, um, and then um, have a controlled um, opening when they, when we do that. What's your, do you use the ripcord that's, that's included or do you just take that out or how's I, your- I don't, I did in the beginning, but I've gone back to my preferred ripcord, which yeah. is um, 60 proline. Um, and so I like that the 60 proline that I thread in is a little bit thinner in caliber than the 4.0 that is um, is okay. threaded in it. Um, I think it's just a little bit easier to tuck um, sort of in the infrotemporal quadrant and get it to stay where I want and um, tends not to erode because of its, its small size. Um, but I tend to do my ligature with a 7.0 Vicryl. So I, okay. do, um, I do let them open on their own when it's appropriate, but I really like the flexibility to be able to pull when you're in a pickle where, you know, and someone's pressure is high. And also I think once in a while, you're just a little surprised, not, not with the clear path in particular, but just in tubes in general, you know, is it open? Is it not open? The pressure is not quite as low as you thought it was going to be. And I think the being able to pull the rip cord gives you that certainty that mechanically the tube is, is open, which I yeah. really, yeah. um, really And like. you tuck it down in the infrotemporal quadrant. Um, and, yep. um, and then, and then remove, do a subconscious cut down and, and remove it if you want to, is that what you do? Yeah. I, you know, more often than not, I actually find I can just grab them with jewelers and the, um, sort of the suture itself will just poke through the conch. Oh, I, um, oh, nice. okay. I think I've only used Venice to cut in maybe twice. So okay. oh, um, yeah. I just, I just kind of grab them. 
Awesome. I think there's a question. Um, Ken Miller, see. she asked, uh, do I lyse the proline ligature? No, I don't. I actually just leave the proline. And if you kind of study fluidics of a tube and resistance, if you just occlude a small section of the tube or constrict it just a little bit, it doesn't really alter the flow through the tube. So uh, I don't try to argon or do anything to my 7 proline. I just pull out the subconj uh, 4 nylon. Um, I have heard of some people trying to argon that proline, and then sometimes they inadvertently cut the 4 nylon and they pull it out and they don't know whether whether it's open or not and then you're really in a pickle because then you have to go cut down the conge so uh so you don't need to touch the uh that proline and uh i think sarah brought up a good point you don't want to ever make sure these things erode um and so just like with the sutured iol uh, when i do tie it off with the 70 proline um i leave the wings a little bit long so they lay flat against the the corner the, the, the sclera don't cut them short other, otherwise they'll poke through and you could get eroded but um yeah, and great question. I think the um, the question that comes up among people who aren't ripcord users, I think, is how what's the earliest you can pull a ripcord and not be afraid of hypotony? What's the earliest you would pull? Yeah, uh, I have. I used to um, before I switched to this technique. Um, I, I would you know fenestrate somewhat aggressively, but sometimes I would um, I would argon my 70 Vicro. I would just close, I would tie it off with the 70 Vicro mm -hmm. and I have opened them as soon as three weeks. Um, okay. um, but um, but typically, um, you know, I I think if, you know, sometimes you can get like in a, in a jam and, and and the pressure goes so high and you have the, the mm -hmm. tube and the fenestrations aren't working the way you want them to. Um, but, uh, but I typically, I think, um, I think the longer you can wait to open it, the better, uh, because then you're not shunting this pro-inflammatory aqueous to the capsule and to the plate. Um, but I would say, I would say, you know, if it looks good and the conge looks closed, um, uh, three weeks. Uh, what about you? Yep, same. I, I really try to get to four, but I think when you're in a bind, I think three weeks is um, yeah. is typically safe. Um, I'm telling you, when you open them, when you open them up at like at six months, it's just it's a dream. The eye is just calm and quiet. You open the tube, you know, even when you see the tube open, you see that one plus cell reaction and, and that kind yep. of stuff when they when it opens with the Vicro at four to six weeks, mm -hmm. you don't see that um, when you open them up for even, th you know, four months, five months. Um, and, um, and I do, I, I haven't, I need to go back and look at this, but, uh, but I do think the longer you can wait to open it, I think the eyes do a little bit better. Um, yeah. What a great pearl. Good. That's, that's what I'm going to take away from this. I think that's yeah. awesome. Uh, it's been, it's been such a, it's been such a change from how I, how I was trained as a fellow. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of a long time ago, about 11 years ago, but, but I really made this change uh, probably three years ago. And, um, uh, and I don't, I don't, uh, it's a kind of a pain for the patients sometimes, because uh, you have to cut the conch down and remove it at the, yeah. at the slump lamp. But, um, but I think the, the ability to get them back to work and to get back to have a, um, their activity is, 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 is worth it. And they do, I haven't had a single patient yet, not tolerate opening up at the, at the slump lamp. Um, so, yeah. but I like your technique of, of trying to poke it through the conch with some jewelers. How do you do, what do you do? Um, I just sort of like, you know, uh, squish back a little bit. So you have, you know, put the jewelers on the surface and then move back. So you have a little laxity and then just kind of grab it and then pull it out. It just kind of makes its own makes this on whole. I mean, I don't blunt it or anything. So it's pretty sharp. Sharp. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. And that's a six, that's a six old proline. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I yeah. like that. That's really cool. That's, that's, that's my pro I got from here. Thank Perfect. you. Um, so uh, so yeah, um, I like that. maybe do you, do you intentionally make it sharp or you just cut it? No, but I think proline is pretty sharp if you don't blunt it. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, let's see here. There's a question about your venting slit method of choice. Um, yeah. So, um, so, uh, yeah, I, um, I tend to vent with a, um, the classic, you know, the TBT, or at least I was trained, um, was to do it with the TG 130 needle. That's kind of how I was trained to do it. Um, but I, uh, I use the, the needle that's on my nino proline. Cause I also use a nino proline to secure the plate and also secure the tube to the sclera. Um, and it's a TG 130. And I don't know the difference between 130 and 140, but, uh, but I think they're about the same. And, uh, and so I use my, I use a TG 140 needle and I will just go through with, uh, you know, I'll secure the, the tube with, uh, ties and I'll just go 
you know, through and make full thickness passes, you know, three to four to five. And I'll kind of do it along the length, some under the corneal patch graft, some more posterior, um, just to get, um, um, just to get, I, I, and it, it depends. Um, I, I, I change it based on what the patient's pre-op pressure is. So if the pre-op pressure is, you know, 20 on max meds, then I know that's my upper limit and I'll be fine for a while. But if a patient, you know, is on the verge of like a pressure of 30 and I really want to do a non-valved implant, then I will be more aggressive with my number of fenestrations. Um, do you ever so do a wick? I don't. Um, I, I, I've never played with that. I, I know a lot of people really like that technique, uh, but I've never, I've never played with that, but I've heard it works. It works well. What about, what about you? What's your technique? I almost always do either three or four venting slits. And I use the, um, the spatulated needle on the seven O bike roll because I use a seven O bike roll for my mm -hmm. Uh, traction I think that's the TG one thirty. I, I think, think it's a. I was gonna say I think it's a TG one thirty, but I just well, couldn't be a hundred percent sure. But um, yeah. I use that same um, suture. I make my my corneal traction suture with it, and then I use the needle for my venting slits, and I use the length of it for my ligature. Oh, so that suture yeah. gets well well used. And you go all the way through the tube. I do. I, do. I okay. grab it just like you said, and I go through and through. Um, and you know, it's really reassuring. You can usually see a little sort of, um, leakage there, a little transudate in those, in those spots, which I think is convincing. Yeah. I think that's a good test. I, I actually yeah. like to do that. I'll pump up the eye and, mm -hmm. um, and see if it can hold a pressure. Um, and then, and it'll also, like you said, it'll, it'll provide you proof that your, your, your fenestrations are working and, um, and, and sometimes they work better than others, depending on, you know, if it's right through the, the, the main part of it, or sometimes you've gotten a low to the top or whatever. So it's mm -hmm. nice to see. And, um, and then you can also use that to, to decide to make one more or two more. Yeah. We talked about rip cords. We talked about venting slits. Are there other pearls that are unique to the Ahmed clear path that you think people would benefit from knowing about um, in terms of their intra-op experience? I, you know, I, I really like the, I, your, your technique of folding it. I think that's really unique. Yeah. To, uh, the flexibility of it allows mm -hmm. you to fold it, which you don't, you can't do with any other plate on the market. Yeah. Um, what, what, so do you, you do that with, do you dissect and then you just fold it and then um, so you you go through a smaller incision then you do your like Stevens and you dissect and create a pocket or what's your how do you do that? Yeah, um, actually, I don't know if I have control. I have two little thirty second videos I could show if the moderators want to give me control, but maybe I can. Let me see. Um, the two fifty, I just um, fold it in half. Let me see if I can. Uh... Yeah, I'd love to see that. This is actually my fellow um, doing his first because I wanted to demonstrate that he could in fact not get it through this hole. So this is my fellow trying to get it in. And then I use my fingers to fold it and grab it and then tuck it in like that. And then it, it, this video is short, um, but then it just unfolds and is in position. Um, but I think um, I can show the foldability of the, um, of the 350 also, I mean, it, not in the, um, let me see here, it's, uh, for the um, for the 350, it's still a pretty small incision. Um, yeah. This was actually my very first 350. Um, and so there it's going under the first muscle, but I think here's the key that you don't need the bigger incision because you can see that it's going to fold right here. There's some flexibility to the plate itself yeah. and you see it fold and then it just slides under that muscle really, really nicely. So, um, you know, I like the fornix incision because I think you really get to see the muscle anatomy, um, quite nicely. That's awesome. Um, and then you just, but I think the um, go ahead. Tunnel underneath that conge and, and, and enter. Exactly. Um, yeah. Then, so you okay. have to dissect a little anterior and a little posterior. Um, but I think the flexibility in, in both the 250 and the 350, um, really aids in, uh, in getting it implanted. Yeah. We have one more question. Um, 
Dr. Miller's asking, um, if it's just me or there's the two material, the clear path a bit less rigid than the FP7. I made some long spiral tunnels and have a hard time passing it through. You know, um, what do you think? Uh, I, I do think that um, the, you know, I think the two materials of the clear path is a little bit different than in the bar belt. It's, um, it, I, I thought it was about the same as the Ahmed, but. Um, yeah, I was thinking um, it was the same as the Ahmed, but I do think it is a little less rigid than the bar belt. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, um, um, I've heard some people having a hard time that, that when they don't use the rip cord, um, I've heard some people having a hard time uh, actually getting it fully occluded, which is which is different than what you'd expect if it was less mm -hmm. rigid. If it was more soft, then I guess it would be probably easier to occlude. Um, uh, so I think some of the, all these tools maybe just have some subtle, subtle differences. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think um, uh, Dr. Miller has a, has a point that when the, um, I have noticed that when the, the my track i usually try to make my track about a millimeter and a half to two and sometimes when it's on the two it is a little bit more uh more difficult to to get it through sometimes when, when my bevel's a little bit more when my tube's a little bit more beveled it's a little bit easier but uh but i do think she's making up a, a really good point have mm -hmm. you noticed that not specifically i mean i actually think the rip cord makes it quite a bit easier to put in mm -hmm. these tubes than um than an ahmed i haven't noticed a specific um specific issue i tend not to tunnel too too much i mean in a pseudo fake i almost always um go in the sulcus and, and unless there's a compelling reason not to i don't yeah. there aren't very many compelling reasons not to and i find that if you're entering in the sulcus you really don't need very much of a tunnel yeah yeah that's a really good point that's a really good yeah. point and when you do your sulcus ones do you do you get them in the pupil access or do you just bevel them posterior and then you don't and you only see them on dilation or what, what's your technique for the for um i'm happy only seeing them dilated i i don't mind if they're a little more into the visual access but i i um if i can see them dilated that's fine and i do dilate those patients where i'm aiming for the sulcus on the day of the case nice um, you dilate them I, preoperatively or yeah. in the pre-op area and so in they the come in okay. area so they come in awesome. dilated um yeah, you know, I've, I've been doing it that way, and I'm pretty compelled by some of the new endothelial cell data. There's a new prospective trial now that actually um, showed that it's pretty convincing that you get a little bit less endothelial cell loss in the sulcus, which is yeah. intuitive. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, in a pseudofake, that's the um, that's a great place for a tube. Yeah, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that really makes a lot of sense because um, it's just you, you have no doubt then, right, that the, mm -hmm. that the tube is away from the cornea. And um, uh, I kind of like to see it a little bit, you know, yeah. on the edge. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's nice the, to be able to see just the tip of the bevel. I yeah. think that's kind of the sweet spot if you can just yeah. see the bevel. Yeah, but it is key to do a posterior bevel. Otherwise, you'll get occluded by, yep. by, the, by the iris, which I've been, I've been burned by before. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, I think the other thing you either want to pass your needle for the sclerostomy up through the pupil or you want to touch the tube with a psychodialysis spatula or something once it's in position it's yes. really critical because you can be deceived you think it's in the sulcus and it's it's yeah, not um yes. so you you do want to take that extra three seconds while you're in the or to be a hundred percent sure that you're anterior to the iol i think that's, that's critical that's such a key pearl and yeah. i can speak to that because i've been i've been burned by that too right you think you're there and then um and then uh, you know, uh, the next day it's somehow behind the lens. And, uh, so yeah, it never hurts to kind of make sure you yeah. touch it. Oh, yeah. there's another question here. I didn't see any pearls to ensure easier placement of the wings of the clear path under the rectus muscles. You know, I do think maybe it's a little more challenging with the clear path than the barbell, because I think the barbell is a little bit because of its rigidity. It's mm -hmm. a little bit more of a workhorse. It kind of, um, if your dissection is imperfect or the, the, um, hooking is imperfect. The barbell can kind of do some of the work for you and get under there. I think the key is just a thorough dissection and really making sure you have the whole um, muscle belly in your hook. And then I think it's, it slides in um, pretty nicely. Yeah, I think your video was perfect. I mean, that really showed a nice dissection and, and it really showed the ease of insertion. Uh, so I thought that was such, I'm so glad you showed that because that was really a good Thanks. technique. Awesome. Well, I think Jackie's back, which means we are winding down. Yes, that was quick. Well, thank you, Dr. Grover and Dr. Van Tassel for joining us this evening. For more information on ClearPath and the rest of our product portfolio, please visit newworldmedical.com and the Learn platform for training and practice resources. We hope you have a great, happy Taco Tuesday and that your families are staying healthy and safe out there. 
I hope you have a great evening. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Sarah, Thanks. so good to see you. Nice job. Same, same. Have a great night. Be well. Take care.